Alrighty. <laughs> hello again. Um, alright. I guess this is it. Oh, hello, Afik. It's nice to see you again. Welcome back. Hello, Mon. How's it going, guys? How's it going? <laughs> I'm proud of you, Afik. That's awesome. <laughs> it does. It does. So, I'm, I'm actually really excited because one of the two characters that we're talking about today we i don't know if we'll get to the second one but the first one that we're getting to today um wants me to actually wreck his character <laughs> he wants to be emotionally torn and that's what we're here for that's what we're here to um to to bring up on that i did read about the false hydra i am very interested in actually using it as a monster later on to like draw some lines between stuff. I'm very excited about it. I really- <laughs> I have a lot of plans, but let's talk about the the characters today. How- you, as a DM I sometimes find it's scary how mean some players are to their own creation. That's so interesting. Um, I actually- actually I do agree with that, but um, what I tend to find is that more players, like when they get, um, enchanted or what have you, um, they don't want to hurt their friends necessarily, but they're pretty okay with everything else happening to their character. Like, they're willing to sacrifice their character, but not for other, not to hurt other people in the group. It's very interesting. I love it. It just, it just kind of tells you how social of a, an activity d d is. To bust the lines of their character up. Okay, I'm gonna switch to my D&D &D chatting so everyone on stream can see the chat later in the recordings as well. Hang on. I'm lost. Blah, blah, blah. There we go. Okay. Can somebody send a message in chat? I just want to see if this is working properly. <laughs> Let's just see. Is this chat gonna work? Oh no, I don't think it is. Unfortunate. Hmm. I wonder why it's not working. Hang on, give me two seconds to see if maybe the the link is incorrect. One moment, one moment. Chat box. Bum, bum. Properties. Okay. I don't think it's working. That's so sad. Oh well. Okay, give me two seconds to grab the link for the original chat box. Blah, one moment. There it is. Copy. And properties. We'll have to fix that later on, I think. One second. Stream chat, woo! It did not work, but I got a, a, a less pretty alternative for now. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so I, I had once a player who wished his character to be part of a demonic cult to mess up the mind of their character. So, fun fact, we're dealing with one of those right now. <laughs> um, the first one we're talking about is not, he's a werewolf, so that's going to be some fun emotional damage to deal with. Um, and then the second character we're dealing with is part of a, uh, a cult type situation. Um, alrighty. So, let's just start with Cass. So, Cass is the, um, he's a lycanthrope. So, he was originally, he was originally, um, birthed within the Vandermeer family from... Goldcrest and Freya. Um, so Freya is, let me pull up the map, is all the way over here on the opposite side of the world, Goldcrest right here, on the opposite side of the world from where we're starting, which is like way over here. Um, so 
not only is he from a different culture, but in the culture he was raised in, he was also an outcast. Um, so basically, they didn't, uh, they didn't want a third child, his parents did not. So, um, when he was birthed, it, they were like, oh, yikes, a third one that we don't want. And also, he's probably the result of an affair, so this is just fun. Awesome. Um, so his parents, both fully human, uh, were a little freaked out when Cass started, like, you know, showing wolf teeth and claws and that type of stuff, especially when he got angry. Um, and so he was strictly forbidden from showing these, um, from showing these, uh, these different traits, fur, fangs, claws, what have you. Um, and whenever it did happen, he was punished. Um, he's still prone to, uh, bouts of anger, which I can personally relate to. I was a very angry child as well. Um, so this is gonna be fun to just weave in a little bit of that emotional damage in there. <laughs> um, he, uh, got in brawls with children, um, his teachers thought he was a problem, and his parents eventually removed him from school and kept him at home away from literally everybody. Um, so, Cass eventually got fed up and decided to leave when he was, um, I think in his teens, if I remember correctly. Um, climbed out of his bedroom window, headed out, hopped on a boat, never looked back. Um, he eventually worked as a dockhand in Ombra, which is the capital of Dakal, and there he met a young half-elf named Ellis. Ellis was a rogue, a thief, he learned pretty quickly that Cass was a-okay with that, just to have a friend who wasn't freaked out by him. Um, and the two formed a friendship, and Cass eventually realizes, hey, it's kind of good money working as a thief. It's not as, it's not as great being a dock hand. Um, so him and Ellis just go around to call and take whatever they need. Um, and Cass was basically the brawn while Ellis was the silent, um, actual thief. So Cass was the one who was creating distractions and roughing people up. Um, the two became extremely close, and they both cared for each other eventually as more than friends, and then eventually luck uh, caught up with them, and the Myriad, who is the Thieves Guild in Dakal, um, were the ones who jumped them one night for s stealing on their turf, basically. Um, Ellis ended up dead, and Cass ended up wounded. So, Cass basically de swears to destroy the Myriad, and he is now journeying through to call, looking for any information he can get on the leader. I'm actually going to do this. Bop. There we go. Perfect. So, we have a lot of emotional damage to do to this character. <laughs> As if enough hasn't already been done. Um, Aman, you had a an insane game yesterday. What happened? What happened? Uh, let me go ahead and shorten this little thing. Also, let me know if the audio is whack at all. Hello, Edwin! How's it going? How's it going? Oh my goodness, this is so fun. Two level 2 and two level 3 characters fight a green hag with bugbear guards as security patrols around the hag's house. That's fun! That's awesome! That must have been challenging for them, though. Oh, thank you, Wafik. I appreciate it. Yay for emotional damage! <laughs> Yay! What every DM loves. Alrighty, so, um, for doing fine, Edwin, that's good. I like to hear that. Um, okay, Cass, future story beats. So, he's a werewolf, which is important. Um, so, fun fact as well, there is a, a group... I think it's... Yes! Chukra! Um, Chukra has a bunch of lycanthropes. So a lot of these... I would like to say that a lot of lycanthropes probably have a little bit of an issue, um, especially in their younger years, controlling their formations. Um, so them forming a a little um, community is totally not out of the scope of reality. 
So what we have here is Chukra is the place where a lot of these lycanthropes ended up going when they felt very out of place in their own homes. Um, I, w I don't want to say that it's a very known place, except for to the people in Varshavan, um, just because it's... It, I, I would imagine that there are groups out there who would want to hunt down lycanthropes. I would just imagine that there are a couple of churches specifically, um, a couple of uh, the gods who were against lycan lycanthropy? I don't know if that's a word or not. Anyway, um, against lichens and would like to probably eradicate this village. So they're not super well known outside of Varshavan and outside of Jugad specifically. Um, so that is something to keep in mind that I do eventually want him to interact with. Um, all right. The player found a studded leather armor and shield. Nice. Yeah, we did nearly no damage. Got crushed from the first cards. Oh my goodness. That's awesome, Amon. I'm glad you guys made it. Yay, like Ruffy. Yes. The assumption of the form and the characteristics of a wolf held to be possible by witchcraft or magic. Yes, yes. Um, the only difference here. Um, so there are a couple of ways that lycanthropy can be a thing um so basically you can be cursed um to be a lichen you can have a bloodline that has lichens in it um and you could have some kind of potion or something that makes that formation um in most of these cases a remove curse spell would be very easy to just get that out of there um granted in my world um even though the spell doesn't say so uh remove curse does require a roll much like um counter spell um so just keep that in mind <laughs> as well um don't mix up your lichens and lichens <laughs> yeah. um okay so what we're going to probably have going on in this character's future um is a i would imagine that in the future i do want there to be a so he's a lichen throw let's let's go ahead and move some stuff around real fast flop flop there we go back there we go all right so he is a lichen throw i want in his future for there to be there to be a choice to get rid of of the lycanthropy. Sometimes my brain moves faster than my hands and I have to double check that I actually wrote something and I didn't think I wrote it. <laughs> um, so I want there to be in the future a choice to get rid of the lycanthropy. Um, either through like a powerful wizard or some shit or a religious uh, ritual or something like that. Um, I think that would be a very good choice for him to make to decide whether he wants to be quote unquote normal or not. Um, all right. A hack could also be mean and put this curse on you. These types are often are rare but hard to get rid of. True, true. Um, so, get then by a regular dude turns you back to normal. <laughs> could you imagine? Does your world have the shifter race? Yes, Edwin. Actually, he is technically a shifter. Um, we are flavoring it in terms of lycanthropy. Um, I just, I actually had to double check with my, um, with my dude. Where is he? Oliver. Perfect. So I was like, just to double check, where is it? Just to double check, is he a werewolf or a separate class of shifter in your mind? And he, and Oliver just, essentially said yeah he's a werewolf um so that's just a fun little fact um blah, blah, blah. so he is a shifter in pretty much everything he is a shifter in um uh, like racial traits and all that fun stuff um but a werewolf in everything else in theory so i actually wanted to show you guys because i forgot to mention it last time i gave all of my players a bonus feat. Um, so for Jesse's, who is um, Ayla, who we talked about yesterday. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? 
we gave her a bonus fee of mechanical parts. So her mechanical parts all have something um, different about them that she's able to use. Um, so the reason I chose to do this is because I think, <laughs> I think a lot of the 5e feats suck. There's a lot of them that suck and a lot of them that are really boring honestly. Um, there's a lot of them that are really cool, but there's a lot of them that are really boring too. Um, so I wanted them to have something that was specific to their character that has to do with their past and their future aligning together. Um, and I wanted it to have an impact on their present. I wanted it to have something that they could do in the moment that could affect the present. So this was Jesse's, which was just a bunch of mechanical abilities. Um, and then for Oliver's, we gave him a lot of stuff that's associated with werewolves. So um, hearing or smell advantage checks, um, charisma for, instead of a charisma for intimidation, he uses strength um, and he regains a number of hit points equal to his level on each turn. So the reason why this may seem overpowered and we actually talked about it might be being overpowered. Um, so it might be a little overpowered, which is which is fine for me, I think, because um, he is the only non magic class. So he's the only one who is going to be up close and personal with the enemies. And I also think that fighters don't have as much um they don't have as much uh health as say a barbarian would so i'm trying to give uh cass who's the character's name a bit of an advantage in comparison to the other characters in terms of getting hit um maybe it can be based on a roll even if it w is a low dc um oh do you mean the the regeneration um i thought of that but honestly I like the less things for me to manage and for things that have to happen on a uh, basically on a turn by turn basis, the better. So the idea of the hit points being regenerated on each turn is something that we don't have to talk about as a player table. It's just that some it's just something that's going to happen. So like say for um for a roll, we would have to be like, okay, go ahead and roll for your regen. We'd have to add up any totals that would happen. Um, and then we would have to essentially spend time that I don't want to spend time on during combat, uh, doing something that is ultimately just going to be very uh, procedural that I can just replace with um, a basic number. So the reason we chose, uh, I originally I was thinking hit points equal to half his level, um, but I thought that might be too little, especially because I want to give them big monsters. I want to make them overpowered. I want to make them be able to kill smaller things in three hits. I want them to be the heroes of this world. And that's why I've kind of made that decision to make them overpowered, to give them these bonus feats, to give these them these bonus abilities. Um, don't forget to add, he does not regain HP if he was hit with silver during the last turn. That's interesting. Hmm. I may have to talk to him about that. So, the thing, I think, hmm. I, w I don't want to add it to this. Specifically because I want Silver to be something he hasn't encountered yet, and I want it to have an impact on him. I was actually thinking that Silver does double damage for one, um, but the Silver hit with, during the last turn, I kind of want to write that down. I am going to write that down, actually. So, Cass Bop does not add... Okay, that would be such an interesting, like, oh no, I'm in trouble. This is, I can't, I can't fight the same way I usually do. I think that would be very interesting. 
Maybe could give a poison condition as long as he's in contact with Silver. Yeah, I like that. That's kind of a, the same idea as, as well of it has a certain duration to it. Um, so don't forget to add he does not regain Silver and could give a poison condition. That would be interesting. Maybe he could save against it? Hmm. Save? I don't know. We will, we'll, I'll brainstorm that later as well. I like those ideas. Thank you guys for bringing those up. Um, so these are all in his normal form. So in his shifted form, at the beginning of his turn, he regains a number of hit points equal to twice his level. Again, this is because I want to hit them with a crazy amount of dice and I want my mages to be weak. I want them to be weaker than he is. He is supposed to be strong, and especially at higher levels, you have melee combatants. Um, most of the time, they're very underpowered compared to their spellcaster friends. So I think that this will eventually even out to the spellcaster's um, higher levels as we go up in level as well. Um, he uh, is able, able to shift a number of times equal to his level divided by two. In the shifter subclass, that's different, or not subclass, <laughs> the shifter race, um, that is different. Um, it is, I think, like once a day or something like that, and I was just like, no, this is my world, I'm making it the way I want it to. <laughs> and that's the fun thing about being a DM. You can just say no to certain rules, which is awesome. Um, and then he has a, another ability called Howl. Three times a day when you howl, every creature that can see or hear you must make a saving throw against your Battlemaster DC. Um, and those who have been uh, exposed to your, your form regularly are immune to this effect. So, fun fact, at the beginning of our campaign, the other, the other people don't know that Cass is a werewolf. And so when he first transforms, he is going to, he's going to scare them. He, they are going to be frightened for the first couple of times that they see his form. But as soon as they get used to it, which I'm going to say is like two or three times, maybe. Mm, we'll see. We'll see um, how they role play that out. And we'll see who is actually going to role play being scared versus people who are like, oh, you're a werewolf. Cool. Sweet. Um, so that's going to be a fun little thing as well. So basically, one, if they fail, they're frightened, and any creature who succeeds is immune to that effect for the next little bit. Um, so yeah, that's the fun thing about Cass, the fun, interesting thing. Um, so I do in the future want there to be a choice to get rid of the lycanthropy. Um, and he wants revenge against the Myriad, for one. This needs to be left or right a little bit. Um, Cass is in Alnar to gather information about Myriad, so we're actually going to put this at the top because we need to deal with that early on in the campaign. Boop. Um, Cass was emotionally hurt by people in his past, and he hurt people in his past. I want there to be trauma. It's gonna be, it's gonna be sad. It's gonna be a little sad. I want there to be flashbacks um, or even nightmares, um, especially because we're dealing with like dreams for our other people as well. I want there to be s flashbacks and nightmares of people in his past. Flashback, um, getting hurt and people hurting him. Um, so flashback for the first one I want is him hurting another kid. I don't like this music. I'm going to change it. One second. Un momento. Try this one. I think I like it. Turn it up so I don't. There we go. Perfect. 
Alrighty, is the, is the volume still okay for you guys? Just double checking. Um. I'm gonna take no complaints as it's okay. So we need like two more seconds. Should be pretty good. There we go. Perfect. Alrighty. So we have a lot of we have a lot of options in terms of of wrecking his life. <laughs> um, do you want a flashback with him hurting another kid? Um, I do want a flashback of maybe somebody at his school outing him to the rest of the community. I think that would be apt methinks so um someone swim when someone maybe in his community or his community his school <laughs> uh outing him to the community i think outing is one two Yes. Perfect. Um, so we do have a lot of fun other stuff that we can do as well. And if you guys have any ideas, toss them in chat. That's what we're all here for, is to have a grand old time talking about how to wreck players' lives. <laughs> um, so. For the fear it might depend on saving throws. As soon as a player saves successfully two consecutive times against the effect, they cut, become immune. I like that. I like that. That's a good idea. Okay, so we'll actually go ahead and toss that. As soon as a player... Perfect. So, we'll put that in the myriad area or in the um in alnar area because that's gonna be we'll put that actually up here we'll put that as a bubble thought right there perfect brilliant i do want it to be different for different people like if somebody is more scared of of casts at the beginning, they will take a little bit longer to become immune. And of course, once they all figure that out, we'll kind of have a little discussion on it being like, hey, if you feel like your character would be freaked out by him, then you should probably keep in mind that you might like freeze up at the beginning of fights when he transforms, that kind of thing. Um, maybe he was called a specific name while being bullied, and if he hears that name again, it could tr trigger him to shift interesting i think i i like that a lot actually um let's move this stuff down so oh do 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 okay that would have to be a a um conversation I'd have with Oliver to see if he wants to incorporate that um especially so there's some personal details I'm not going to share about Oliver without his permission at least um that this may be a little bit more than triggering for him so I don't want to actually traumatize my player themselves just the character you know <laughs> so uh we're gonna i'm gonna talk to him about that and see if that's okay with him so specific name uh that hang on one second character class is he uh he is a uh fighter uh battle master is that what they're called battle master I am having a brain brain malfunction. Battlemaster, yes. For some reason, that sounded weird to my name, to my brain. Um, so specific name that he may have been called that tr 
curious. One, two, transform, or maybe lose control to some extent. That would have to be a, a um, conversation I would have with him. So I will just star that as well. Perfect. I like that idea a lot. Um, lovely, lovely. Specific name by name. Recall to trigger him. I like that. Okay, let's bop, 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 bop. There we go. So, Cass is in Alnar to gather information about the Myriad. One second. Perfect. Okay. Um, alright, so he's in Alnar to gather information about the Myriad. So, the important thing about Alnar is that they are going to be meeting in the very early hours of the morning, like just after sunset, which in a place so close to the equator would probably be like 4 a.m., 5 a.m.? Did I say sunset? I meant sunrise. <laughs> 4 a.m. or 5 a.m.? Um, and they're all going to be meeting in a in basically the courtyard or the main square, sorry, of this city. Um, I will actually show you guys my DM resources. So we're going to be starting in Alnar. Uh, the date will be the 25th of Fortuna. You will have all working up early. Um, they all get to decide why they woke up early. Um, for him, it's going to be to talk to the sketchy people of the city in the wee hours of the morning. Um, and he is going to be trying to essentially gather information about where the the HQ of the Myriad is, for one, um, because the Myriad does cover um, the, the entirety of Rundar. So it could be anywhere in here, but we as the DM know that it's in Umbra. Um, so he is going to be meeting um, a shady person to, uh, my brain isn't working, <laughs> to gather information. All right, sunset and sunrise, depending on the sleeping schedule, is mostly similar. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Um, for adventurers, I sometimes believe they don't have a schedule, sleep schedule at all. Yeah, so that's the fun thing, I think. Um, like, a normal person should be getting eight hours of sleep to function properly. Um, adventurers, or at least the, the rule I have for my world, um, for the players in my world, is that they only have to actually sleep six hours, but they have to have eight hours of rest. So, basically, they can have a two-hour, um a two hour watch or two hours of just light reading or what have you, something that gives them rest. It doesn't necessarily have to be a sleep of eight hours for, for my players. Okay. Do, 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 to gather information. I also need to put some opportunities to, okay, I need to mark this with info, 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 opportunities to gather information on the leader of the myriad, where they are located, how to get into the HQ of the Thieves Guild, ETC, perfect. Yes, I have the same rule for the long rest. <laughs> nice! Um, so, a, I've actually found that most people have a very similar rule, if not the exact same rule. Um, I just like to... I like to have rules in place to some extent. There's some things that I don't like having rules for. I can't think of any right now. But <laughs> I like having rules in place so that my players are not caught off guard when I make a certain ruling in a certain situation. Um, it's usually so that I can, um, like, basically reference previous rulings I've made and, 
and say, hey, this is how I run this situation. I think I'm going to run this situation in a very similar way. Um, I wonder how his armor would hold up with him shifting as a true werewolf. That's a great question, actually. Um, let me look up something real fast. Shifter 5e. They get an armor bonus, don't they? Bop, wow. I've already, I already know the site is safe, just to, by the way. Um, shifters are sometimes called wear touched. Uh, he is the long tooth. Where is it? Long tooth kind. Um, elongated fangs, but abilities tough. Whenever you shift, you gain temporary hit points and a plus one bonus to your AC. So the shifting is actually a really good question. That's a ruling I need to make in my world, actually, about whether or not his armor shifts into him or not. Hmm. Huh. Let me actually pull up his, let's pull up his character sheet and see what it looks like real fast. It's hmm. a wonderful question. What is happening? There it goes. Music stopped for some reason. Okay, cool. Um. Okay, so, AC 18. Hmm, let's take a look. Combat features, racial traits. Um, Battlemaster. Oh, his items here, maybe? Equipment, plate armor. Okay. Doo -doo -doo. Armor, 5e. Plate. Plate armor. There it is. Okay, so that's just an 18. Strength, 15. Disadvantage on stealth checks. I don't want to, like, take that away from him, though. Hmm. Uh, Wafik, this is really fun and I enjoyed it so much, but I need to go now. Well, when will you probably be streaming again? I'm hoping to do a, for me, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning routine. So it's going to be at the same, roughly the same time on Tuesdays and Wednesdays every week. Um, so whatever time zone you're in right now, it's going to be roughly on that same time today and yesterday of every week. So, um, yeah, thank you for coming. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> thank you for your, um, for your contributions as well. I really appreciate it. Um, okay. So Edwin, how would you personally do this? I'm curious because I don't want to take away his armor. But I feel like 18's a really high AC. Hmm. Well, it's not that high when you're at 7th level, I guess. At lower levels it is, but I don't think it's 7th level. Hmm. I think I I'm I'm under I think I have to let him keep the AC personally. Not because like I literally have to, but because it just feels like pulling the rug out from under him in a way. If I don't let him keep the AC. I don't know. I don't know how to do that. For a level 3, I would say 18 is high, but level 7 could sometimes have different options monster-wise to play outplay armor. That's true, that's true. 
Maybe add a bit for him that his current armor was modified for him. If he decides to wear another armor, he has to go to a smith to modify it and show the smith he is a werewolf to get the measurements. Yes! That's perfect. That's perfect, actually. It has, like, almost an armadillo effect that it would, like, shift outwards to, to um, accommodate for the new body type. Okay armor bop perfect that's another thing to talk to him about i will have to i will have to go through this <laughs> and ask him about that that's a really good idea um so his armor has like layers to it that kind of shift out so that he can when his body grows into the werewolf form it just shifts out to to um accommodate for that that's really good I like that a lot. Um, okay, perfect. That solves that issue. I like that a lot. Um, okay, specific name that I've even been called that triggers him to transform. Um, is there anything else we want to add for his to as a detail on his lycanthropy as as something that we want to to play on a little bit in the future? Um, I feel like I want to add something else for this for the future. For the Mirage ones, I had the idea that she needs a specific way her leather armor is made to contribute her shape changing ability. Yes, exactly, exactly. Perfect. Um okay, so there to be a choice to get rid of the lycanthropy in the future, maybe a name that triggers him, and then I also I think I pop down here and pop. and we will say there is a lichen uh, a city in in Varsha is it two ways there. <laughs> How I spelled my fantasy stuff? Yes, it is two ways. Perfect. There is a Lycan city in Farshmar. I think maybe we toss this actually just under here. Delete. Mirage is a changeling, so her shifting of height must be thought in when she looks for armor. That's so interesting. So it like has to elongate with her. Cool. Um, okay. Do, do, do. Perfect. Pop that down just a little. Alright. So this, I kind of want to do <laughs> the cast Wants Revenge arc a little bit later. So I, I think if we're okay with everything else, we're going to do the He Wants Revenge Against the Myriad. Because that is super, super Fun. And I've actually already talked to him about this, and the fact of the matter is, this leader is probably so much more capable than Cass is, especially at the level he is now, and even in near future levels. Um, so like, 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th, probably up and I would imagine that the leader of a thieves guild would have to be a level 20 thief, just personally. Um, so I do think that this person is going to absolutely destroy Cass in battle, and that's okay. And we talked about this, and it's okay that he is going to be absolutely wrecked by this person in battle. <laughs> it's gonna be fun. Um, so we're gonna toss a, a little thing here saying the leader of the thieves guild is much stronger than Cass is. There are some stri si straps on the side to give in when she sh grew or shrink and did vine wise. Okay. Okay, cool. She still needs to use her dexterity to still be protected. Yeah, that that makes sense a lot because it has to it has to I assume it's like leather armor more than likely. 
um, if the dexterity is important for it. So that makes a lot of sense. That's really cool. I like that. Um, in terms of a changeling, that makes sense because their transformations are a little bit more pre-planned, probably. But for a werewolf, I feel like you would have to be able to go in and out of shape as quickly as possible because sometimes it's not always purposeful. Yeah. Mirage is a warlock hexblade entertainer, so her different forms sometimes could be helpful. Nice. Nice. Is this your personal character or a another or one of your players' characters? Or are you even a DM? That's a good question. <laughs> Um, okay, so Matt, uh, Cass wants revenge against the Myriad. The leader of the Thieves Guild is much stronger than Cass is. Um, he has to be able to find them. Be able to find the leader and actually be able to challenge them. So he has to be able to challenge the, the guild leader without the 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 rest of the guild just like laughing him out of the place you know um <laughs> nice nice Alrighty. um okay so i think i also want this leader to teach him a life lesson a little bit. I want this leader, so here's the problem. We have a weird balance where we have to we have to acknowledge that the people who hurt Cass and Ellis are not the same people are not the same as the leader. The leader is leader over probably a couple of different groups of people. He is not only the leader of Dakal's Thieves Guild, but the entirety of Rundar's Thieves Guild. Um, and thus, he is just the... He is essentially the light bulb above all of the cogs in the wheel. Um, so we have to acknowledge that he is not actually the problem. The lead the leader is not actually the problem um on top of that hmm i think i want the thieves guild leader to be a man which is important to oliver's history but not necessarily to this character's history i think um which again i'm not gonna share oliver's history but it is important i think that the Thieves Guild leader is a man. Is a man. Womp womp wow. And then on top of that. Oh my gosh, we're gonna have so many things. We gotta move everything down. You could make the case that he let the problem fester in his rule. Yes, that's a that's a very good that's a good point. Um I think that we need to determine the hierarchy of the Thieves Guild. Not necessarily like lay it out, the hierarchy, but more of how any of this information would possibly get to the leader. What influence does the leader have over the individual, over the individual guild members? Um, for, uh, hmm. I want him to be approachable to people who are already like part of the thieves guild who have gone through like the trials who've gone through their the first thieving who've paid their essentially tithes to um the guild to keep it up and running and keep everyone in contact with each other and um keep equipment uh up for everybody so i want i want the people who did attack Cass and Ellis to have been like gentrified um, members. So the people who attacked 
Cass and Alice R. Mm, can I spell? Alice R. Um. Are are members of the guild. Um, and I also don't think. I think we also need to determine if the if the act of attacking Cass and Ellis was inherently a bad thing. Um, I think we can all just equally agree that Ellis dying was probably not intended for one, and for two was probably not good. It was probably not the best way to handle the situation, killing Ellis, personally. Um, so I think we can determine that the act itself was bad, but not necessarily that the act of enforcing thieves' territory is bad within the the idea of a thieves' guild, if that makes sense. Um, in his organization, not that he this totally makes him guilty, but some fell to him. Okay, yeah, some of that responsibility is there for the thieves, uh, for the leader. Um, just because he is in charge of everyone. Sadly, this kind of leader also can be easily manipulated if someone uses his cards right. While I agree with you, I would agree for pretty much anything except the Thieves Guild. I think the Thieves Guild leader would have to be extremely charismatic and would have to be capable of detecting lies. And I think that they would have to be not entirely, but pretty impervious to manipulation. Um, again, not entirely, it's possible, but I do think it's really important that a Thieves Guild leader not be manipulated like they manipulate other people. You know, be able to recognize those signs. Um, what I often don't like in a story that a leader takes all the blames of his underlings and needs to be punished in the same manner like in some stories I've sometimes found. See, that's exactly what we're struggling with here. Cass wants revenge against somebody who did not actually do the deed, and we've talked about this. He's not going to get that revenge. He's not going to be able to defeat the Thieves Guild leader. We're just, like, bar none, like, even if he did not have an entire guild around him, this Thieves Guild leader is in and of himself extremely talented and extremely strong. So, even on a one-on-one, -on -one, Cass would not be able to kill this guy. Um, so that's part of it. Um, but I also think that Cass's anger is very obviously misdirected. And I think it's also very important to determine whether or not we want the Thieves Guild leader to A, entertain him. Which I think I do. I think I want them to fight and Cass to lose. I want him to fight the leader and cast to lose. Um, and two, whether the Thieves Guild leader will offer up the person who killed Ellis as retribution. I don't mean manipulation in a regular sense, but it is a sort of manipulation to manage to let him not th see things that fester on his watch. Yeah, that's fair. I would, I would agree with that. I definitely think that I think that the hierarchy is probably going to go like the Thieves Guild leader and then the leaders of individual cities type situation. Um, and probably within Umbra itself, he probably has even like a subgroup of like leaders in Umbra and then another uh, section of just leaders in the different cities that are in Dakal. Um, and then under that are all the lackeys, all the individual like kind of governmental systems at this point underneath each of the individual mini leaders so that is just i think that's how the hierarchy is probably structured um if the leader hears about this he would see this as a personal insult that this could happen under his watch and could be shown so openly i i think if we were dealing with a group of people with so <laughs> this is where we get into fun things about morals versus law. So in terms of this character, I don't think he would be offended that somebody was killed for encroaching on his territory. 
Like, I just don't... I don't think he'd be particularly upset about that fact. Maybe he might be upset about the way that it happened. And maybe he might be upset if they did not get any warnings or anything like that. Which is probably what happened. Um, I can't imagine that nobody would give him a warning and be like, Hey, you're on the Myriad's turf, dude. You gotta, you guys gotta stop stealing here. Um, I can't imagine that didn't happen, but that's probably something I'm gonna have to bring up to Oliver as well. So I will write that down in my notes. Um, did Cass and Ellis get any words of warning from random thieves in uh while they were on myriad turf perfect um the guild master should be a dirty fighter i like that idea actually a lot i i want this fight to be very suave if that makes sense I want it to, I want him to make a fool out of Cass. I want him to be like, even if I was fighting you seriously, like, you would be dead. <laughs> I want him to be very cocksure. I want him to be uh, suave and absolutely down to fight some dude who thinks that he could do anything against him, you know? I want them to have a one-on-one. -on -one. I'm very excited about that. Um, as the guild leader, I would be livid if I heard about this attack on someone of my order without my direct knowledge or, or approval. Um, I don't... I Personally, I would as well. But I'm also a micromanager. <laughs> I am very much a... I want things done in... in I want things done the right way. But this leader probably doesn't care. I mean, if you want to talk to anyone, talk to one of to the dudes who were in charge of the dudes who t attacked you. Like, I'm not in charge of the everyday stuff. I'm in charge of everything else. I'm in charge of making sure people get money to me. I'm in charge of having a good time. I'm in charge of providing for my guild members and when times get tough. Um, I very highly recommend a series called Becca Cooper. Um, it's, I I love it. I also love the thieves, thieves Guild system there. So what they have is a person called a rogue who is in charge of all the thieves. And it's kind of like this actually, where um, everyone kind of pays a tithe to the, to the rogue. And um, it's, it's really cool because during the books there's a famine that happens and so the rogue is in charge of protecting everybody who's part of his organization and honestly even the the poor people depend on him to some degree um to provide for them when the government will not um so i want this character to be sympathetic and empathetic to other people to still be human to still have a moral compass but be like hey you knew you were on myriad turf you knew the re you knew that it was possible that you could get caught and you paid the ultimate your friend actually paid the ultimate price for it kind of thing um if he speaks about it during a gathering of the guild i can see that he's not angry about the deed is done but how it was mentioned and could reflect on his ability to rule that's an interesting idea actually um <laughs> pocket sand i just I, I glanced down and saw the pocket sand um when this is mentioned openly by a gathering that can backfire greatly <sighs> i i think if you were talking about a government official, the answer would be yes. I think in terms of the Thieves Guild, like, these two, Ellis and Cass, are not part of the Thieves Guild. They are stealing on Myriad Turf. They are encroaching on, basically, the leader of the Thieves Guild rule within 
basically honor among thieves, but, and they broke those rules, essentially. Um, maybe be able to trip or throw a pocket sand as a bonus action. I actually kind of like the idea. I know you're joking, but <laughs> I kind of like the idea of the guy, like, tripping him, and then as Cass turns around, like, wiping blood from his mouth, um, he, he just, like, kicks dirt in his face or something like that, you know? Something to ridicule him to some degree. Um, in a story, I once had a guild leader who played with the character and started to play dirty after he got bored. He played like a nobleman only to prepare so the dirty blow hit so much better. Yeah, I like that. Like, I want it to be, like, a proper fight at first. And then it's like, dude, you're you're literally fighting me in my house and over something that you did on my turf. Get wrecked. <laughs> so it's just going to be a little bit more of a... Um, it's going to be an entertainment spectacle for the guild, I think. Um, okay. Let's see. The people who attacked Cass and Ellis are members of the guild. Hmm. The people who attacked Cass and Ellis are members of the guild. But the... They are uh, members of the guild. Let's hit an enter on that. Let's do a let's do a little bop bop. Eh. There we go. Are members of the guild. They are just lackeys to someone on the third or fourth rung down from the leader so i definitely want them to be like lower to the point where it's almost a little ridiculous that Cass blames this on this guy i find the idea in the book funny he started to play the nobleman only to create an opening for him because he never promised to play him fair to begin with no, nope, my promise was to fight you in a duel, not about the methods or conditions. Yeah, I like that. I like that quote, actually. Mm -mm. Um, so, leader is a man. Actually, let's just toss this. Bop. Promise not about the methods or conditions. I like that a lot. There we go. Pop that right there. Um. <clears throat> so I want. Uh, I think we'll toss this right here. Cast blame. I like. I don't want to. I don't want to completely embarrass the character. But I do want it to be a spectacle for the guild. I want them to be embarrassed to a certain extent, if that makes sense. Um, that night that was in the book was so angry about the thief. Yeah, that's the fun thing is we're coming from two different people who are have two very different perspectives on life. Um, and... I think something that probably draws people to the Thieves Guild is a sense of brokenness. I think people who came from families where stealing was all they could do um, because there was nothing, there was nothing to eat at dinner. Um, I think there's going to be people who came from families who were very broken and were just looking for another for a family of their own they like found family type thing i don't want the thieves guild people to be unfeeling terrible people if that makes sense you know uh yeah it, exactly so the thief played his own sense of nobility against him thieves have a different morality system than probably your average person does um, 
I protect my people, show me the evidence and the person, and we deal with it. Yeah, exactly. So, part of the reason I don't think the leader would have a problem with them attacking um, Ellis and Cass is because he protects his own people. The Thieves Guild is a selfish organization in and of the fact that they care about their own people, but very much like a... Um, a, uh, a government cares for its own people like you you look at literally any war and while the loss of life is devastating for the most part you're only honoring your own soldiers you're only honoring your own people all right um Cass blaming the leader is somewhat of a um, ridiculous idea in the eyes of the thieves guild i would say of the myriad okay the Pirates of the Caribbean, Jack Sparrow, after Will draws his sword, put it away, son. It's not worth you getting beat again. Will Turner, you don't, you didn't beat me. You ignored the rules of engagement. In a fair fight, I'd kill you, Jack Sparrow. That's not much incentive for me to fight fair, then, is it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's nice. Thief, what had you expected? I cannot, I can't win against you in a fair fight, so why should I do so? Exactly. Um, I think these are both very good quotes on the situation. Um... I think that <laughs> I think that this leader I don't want them to f I want them to fight dirty but only to the extent of ridiculing him but not fighting dirty as in like involving another person or something like that um, I want them to both have, both have weapons, I want them to fight each other, and I want the, the, the dirty fight part of it to mainly be in the aftermath of a blow. I want it to be a follow-up of a blow. And at the end of the fight, I want... Um, he has to be able to find them later and actually be able to challenge them. Um, I think we'll, we'll toss this down here. And then we will toss, let's see. Um, Cass is fighting someone with probably a different moral compass to him. Um. about the methods or conditions and oh no um hang on <laughs> copy paste mm. 10 point perfect this is 10 point yes all right copy and paste a million times we'll drag this down here and then um, at the end of the fight, I want him to be, I want him to be almost pitying Cass. I want him to look down at Cass and be like, I was once where you were. I was full of anger and I was full of feeling like the world is unfair, but I made the world my own, kind of. was unfair to me. Uh, let's make this just a little bit bigger so you guys can see what I'm typing while I'm mum mumbling. <laughs> um, the world was unfair to me. 
but I made a world of my own. I like that, actually. That I made a world of my own. Um, okay, let's lower this down a little. Just a tad. But I made a world of my own. That's the kind of vibe I want. The character of Batman also often works this way. He can't win against the superhumans he meets in a regular base through normal means, so he adapts a strategy where he could. Mm -hmm. Um, And then Edwin says to humiliate his enemy, maybe he has a reaction he can use when he is missed with an attack. Fancy footwork. I like that. I like that a lot, actually. Um, Okay. We've got, we've got so many ideas flowing here. Okay. Um, I need to do for the leaders, whoops, leaders stat, stat, stat sheet. I like the, I like the idea of calling it fancy footwork. I've missed with an acrobatic check. Uh, he with this one attack, he can roll an acrobatics check versus athletics or acrobatics. If shit's successful, the attacker goes prone. I like that a lot. I definitely love the idea of giving him some more um, abilities that don't exist in the D and D world yet. Um, just because this is a this is a really super fucking powerful dude. Why does OneDrive give me these? Updates. Turn off notifications. Delightful. Um. Boo, 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 boo. Yeah, I love the idea of calling it fancy footwork, especially. I think that's such a fun turn of phrase. Uh. Do, do, do. Yeah, I love this so far. As soon as the player saves successfully two consecutive times, it gets the effect that you come near me. Keep the person shady gather information um there to be a choice to get rid of the lycanthropy okay so let's go ahead and start ordering these the way that i think they should be ordered so bop bop we'll do bop and we'll do bop okay let's do dog Dog. Dog. I feel like I did. I did not. Okay, uh, copy paste. I actually want to expand on this a little bit. Just a tad. The people who attack Cass and Ellis are members of the guild. They are just lucky to someone on the third or fourth ring down from the later. Um. blaming the leader is some whatever ridiculous idea in the eyes of the myriad but I also want the leader to empathize and be like what happened to your friend is unfair I want him to acknowledge that the um, that the death of Ellis was not equivalent to the crime if that makes sense the death of uh Leader should acknowledge that the death of Alice Ellis is not equivalent to the crime committed. Is it two T's or one T? It's one A. No. Perfect. Delightful. Guildmaster, you remind me of a younger me. So much anger pointed at the wrong direction. I felt as though the world wasn't fair, so I used my anger to build some resemblance of it. Nothing is perfect, but we try. Gives him a hand to get him to have him stand up. Yes, I like. I definitely want. I want there to be first a. Um, I want there to first be something that's almost condescending. 
So like maybe a chin lift or something, you know, a little subtle like that. Something that's a little condescending. Something. Uh, uh, after the fight. Something. I think I actually want to include this in the thing. Um. Okay, after the fight, something condescending, like a chin lift, and then something, um, what's the word? Uh, um, comradeship, fellowship, fellowship works. Um, then something with more fellowship to it. Uh, a hand to help help him up. One's lives should never be a price to pay. That's okay. One's life should never be a price to pay, pay with... I would say, probably until one is old. Should never be a price to pay until one person, until somebody is old. Yeah, that's, that's a good quote, actually. I like that. I think... I... I think that... Somebody in a thieves guild would probably have a little bit more value for their life than even somebody who's been in government their whole life or came from a family who's um, very affluent. I think that somebody in Thieve Guild knows what hardship is. I think that's something that they can relate to more than probably a lot of people it would be somebody who had to turn to thieving in order to find a worth li a life worth living if that makes sense um yeah um do, do, do. let me go ahead and i think that that kind of ideal i'm gonna move this way down we're just we're so on this topic i love it <laughs> um let's do let me move over slightly so i can grab this no i'm grabbing the other ones there we go Perfect. Move it down to here-ish. Um, okay. So, let's pop this down to here. And someone in the Thieves Guild would know what a hardship is. They would have to, I think, um, uh, not they would have to, but they would have found something to make life worth living within the guild. I think that works. Yeah, sure, put that here for me. Perfect. Um, I play a bard who shares ghost stories they met in the afterlife. That's so cool. So Robin often uses the word thing. She don't she doesn't like it when a story is cut shorter than it should. That's so sad when she talks about the passing of a kid. That's such a sad line. So she doesn't need to spell it out in details. I like that. That's a really good character idea. That's so sad. Oh, man. Oh, no. Alrighty. My promise was to fight you in a duel, not about the methods or conditions. 
I definitely want, like, I, I want this, I want this character to have life in him. I want him to have morality. I want him to empathize with what Cass is going through, but that doesn't really excuse the behavior, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I think so. As an elf from the Shadowfell, she's surprisingly compassionate. Yeah, that's, I think that's something that people who haven't dealt with death in their life kind of miss, is just how short everything feels, kind of. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense, but that's how life feels to me. It's like, everything feels like it's slipping away, almost. I like, I like characters who explore that. It's very interesting. Um, I think that we have Cass written out. Unless you guys have other, like, unless you guys have other emotional bits that should be out into his future, um, I think that that's pretty good so far. Cass wants revenge against the Myriad, um, uh, Cass was emotionally hurt by people in his past, and Ca Cass hurt people in his- in his past. Perfect. I wanna put these up here. Um, control Z. Um, this is definitely gonna have to go towards the bottom, methinks. Not the super bottom, but towards the bottom. Um, I understand your grief, but that doesn't make your deeds better. Let us talk about what brought you here. I don't... I love the idea of maybe later that happening, but I don't... I want Cass to make the first move if he wants to have a any kind of relationship with the with the thieves guild leader i want him to reach out to talk to the thieves guild leader about maybe what happened in his life what happened in cass's life and have a conversation about that um oh yeah absolutely yeah <laughs> i don't that's what we're here for we're here for brainstorming mode um understanding doesn't mean you excuse one deeds but you knew where they were coming from yeah I, I want there to be an opportunity if Cass wants to be the one to reach out to, uh, for them to have a conversation. Mm, okay. Perfect. This needs to be a little higher up. This is probably going to be somewhere in the middle. Leader is a man is probably going to be up here. He's probably going to find that information pretty early on. He has to be able to find the leader. This is probably here. And then this is something that he kind of finds out a little bit later. <laughs> when, um, I, I kind of want him to have an idea that the Thieves Guild leader is way stronger than him. But I don't. I don't want hmm. I want him to have an idea, but I don't want him to know exactly how strong they are. I want him to be able to be like, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to wreck his life because he killed Ellis. Um, which in his mind, the leader killed Ellis, even though he didn't actually. Uh, do you know the series Avatar? Do I know the series Avatar? <laughs> yes, I love Avatar. I love it so much. Um, fight in duel, perfect. Um, this needs to go... Uh, I think this is fine after the fight. I think Cass is aware of this. Um... Actually, I'll put this, eh, control Z. We'll bring this down a little, and then we'll bring that up a little. As 
long as a guild leader pulls a similar move as Boomy. <laughs> I like that. Um, you actually bringing that up kind of made me think about this scene where Sokka's like making fun of the um, the Kyoshi warriors and they basically ridicule him into not being an asshole anymore. Um, and that's the vibe. That's the vibe. <laughs> Hello, Luna! Welcome back! It's nice to see you. How are you doing? We are talking about a character who's a werewolf, essentially. He's a shifter in actuality, but a werewolf in theory. Um, and we're talking about how his, uh, him and his friend slash lover, uh, Ellis, um, they were attacked by, um, they were thieves and were attacked by members of the Thieves Guild, and those members killed Ellis. Um, so Ellis, he's dead. Um, and now Cass wants revenge against the, the Myriad. Um, so we're kind of talking about the, essentially the, the moral differences between a, a Thieves Guild and a, um, and a and like a normal person who's not in the thieves guild <laughs> um and and um my brain isn't working and basically how the leader of the thieves guild would react to being essentially blamed for the actions of somebody who's like four rungs below him in the hierarchy ladder um how am i i'm doing a okay i'm i'm really happy to be talking about dnd <laughs> if you uh, get me talking about D&D. I won't stop because I love it. It's a lot of fun. It's my favorite thing. <laughs> um, so I'm just happy to be here, honestly. And I'm a little surprised that there's so many people who are interested in my storytelling, which is really cool. Um, uh, a shifter in theory are bloodlines of werewolf highly diluted over the ages. So you wouldn't be wrong to describe it this way. Yeah, so that inherently they're they're lichens, but for for him, <laughs> he is very much a werewolf. He's not diluted. Um, we were actually talking about the um, the different bonus feats that I've given my players, and his is based on like. Um, werewolf lore like regeneration abilities and stuff like that we also talked about silver and all that fun stuff um yeah <laughs> um all right so Cass's future story beats we've got him wanting to gather information about the myriad the myriad is the name of the thieves guild by the way um Cass is a lycanthrope a werewolf Cass wants revenge against the myriad um, it's important that the leader is a man. Um, there is a Lycan city in Varshavon. So this is basically the chronological order of how I want him to work in the future, I guess. Basically the story beats I want him to go through, which is, you'd never guess it. <laughs> um, so I'm actually going to spread these out a little bit. They're a little, they're a little smooshed. Just a little smooshed. Just a little. Bring this one up. Just one. Okay, and then we'll... Okay, and then we'll bring this one down and bring the rest of these down perfect sorry i just wanted that to be a little bit more readable for future me <laughs> um okay there is a larkin uh a like our larkin a lichen um doo -doo 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 -doo. a lichen city in varshavon it's over here so they're starting in alnar and then the lichen city is down here um Cass wants revenge. He needs to be able to find the leader, which I think, I think the only way that he would actually be able to challenge the leader. I actually want to expand on this a little bit. We're back at it. Back at it again. Bring this down slightly. Um, all right. So he has to be able to actually find the leader and actually be able to challenge them. I think as of right now, in my mind, 
the only way that I think somebody would be able to get a audience with the leader of the Thieves Guild and not be like thrown out is to become part of the Thieves Guild. That's what I think. Unless he decided to sneak in there, which would be kind of hard against a bunch of thieves, personally. I, I just think that would be difficult. <laughs> I think it might be. Um, let's take a look at that. It went away. I read a bit about Shifter after a player I had chose to be one. Always nice to know backgrounds of play races a player has. Yeah. What would the leader look like? That's a good question. I want... I don't want them to be a shifter. I feel like that would be a bit too one-to-one, -one, if that makes sense. So I do, uh, I want, I want him to be handsome. He's gotta be handsome. He's gotta make people want to follow him. I want him to be handsome in the way that's a little weird, you know? Like, he's a lanky boy, for one, because his dexterity is gonna be off the charts. Um, He's going to have so let's let's do a little let's do a little description of where is my notes. Okay. Um Linky Boy, for one. I don't I honestly don't think his looks, aside from him being lanky, is important. Um I want him to I want him to be handsome not in the way that's like classically handsome um but in a way that makes you look at this person and be like wow i'm okay with following this person i want him to have kind eyes Ooh, yes kind eyes a uh, charming smile type situation and a very smooth voice Smooth, powerful voice. Um, in terms of looks, uh, given the area that he that he's in, he would probably have. Sorry, there we go. Um, he would probably have uh dark skin and dark hair. But other than that, what the heck? I wrote that in the wrong place. Um, but other than that, I just don't, I don't think his looks are as important as his motivations, which not to say they aren't important, but that would be kind of something I would expand on later, I think, at this point. Um, I wish to see him try to sneak in only to fail in the first attempt. I... If he were to fail, he would probably be killed. <laughs> you don't go just sneak into the Thieves' Guild and get away with it, you know? You don't just walk into Mordor. Um, so you're going off the shifter from the Monster of the Multiverse book in a way? I believe at least the shifter that I'm looking at is um, in... in um, is it... Ravnica or Aver Everon? Ravnica or Everon? Uh, Everon. Yeah, they're all from Everon, I believe. Yeah. So this is the one I- I'll actually toss this link in chat as well, just to make it a little bit easier for everybody. Uh. Yeah, this is the one I'm looking at. Um, where did my chat go? So you're going on, would be a nice detail in a changeling as a th leader of a thieves guild. Um, yes, that would be, that would be really fun. And I actually imagine something a little bit more exciting would be in like Eulatia or um, something like that. Um, probably Eulatia would be a little bit more exciting, but for the Thieves Guild of Dekal, uh, specifically Rundar, but mainly Dekal, um, it's, it's important for this character to be somewhat of a mirror to Cass, 
So he's human. I want him to be human, for one. Um, I guess that's probably what you meant when you were talking about um, what he looks like. I just forget to talk about things that are already in my brain. Um, but I want him to be human and be somewhat of a mirror to Cass. I want Cass to look at this guy and be like, well, look what he's doing with his life. Probably cast out of his home. Probably poor and had a shit life. You know? And he made something with it. I want Cass to feel that. I want him to feel like this person made something with it. Um, I don't have the Eberron book, so I can't see all the information on shifters and that. I do have the Monsters of the Multiverse book in front of me now, actually. Nice! I don't think I have that book. I don't have that book. I have a lot of books, but I don't think that is one of them. Maybe I do have that book. I don't know what books I have. They're on my shelf. Um, Crowley, a shadow sorcerer I play, is a changeling who uses a semi-human look as his real identity form. Um, I actually have a... Um, I have a, uh, a half-orc who has a human form. It's part of her backstory. Um, and... Uh, it was it's just so much fun imagining what they would be like if they were a different species it's so interesting um yeah so that's what we're dealing with there um he's able to we need to so if he so he has two options basically two options Sneak into the thieves guild. Probably not successfully. Actually, that would be a fun story path, I think. So let's say he goes into the thieves guild and gets caught, as you probably do when sneaking into a thieves guild. Um, I think that it would be really cool for him to get caught and be like take me to your leader i want to i want to talk to him he's i got beef with this guy um <laughs> and then the and then the dude being like yeah the little the leader will get a kick out of this like this guy's a riot he thinks he could he could fight him he thinks he can fight him seriously that kind of thing. I think that would be really fun. And they take him to the leader to decide what to do with him. Um, I think I'm gonna bop. And then the other option is to become part of the um, of the thieves guild and be able to get into the essentially I'm, I think that there's probably like a hall where all the thieves gather for like meals and stuff like that um, where you would probably run into this guy as well. He got thrown out after the scholar circles for his eldritch findings. He gave up pretending to be human. Yeah, that's fun. Um, guild leader, let him be. He seems to be a funny distraction of the normal day-to-day -day work. Yeah, exactly. Anybody who's good enough to sneak into a thieves guild gets recruited. I love that. I love that. That's so funny. And then we'll, we'll do, um, hmm, yawns, man. We'll do a little in-between <laughs> these two options of anybody who's good enough to sneak into a thieves guild gets recruited. <laughs> I think, I think that's so funny. That's hilarious. Um, 
some guard. Could also be funny if the guard is the guild leader who catches the kid only to mess with him. That's fun. That's fun. To get fun out of a boring day. It's like... It'd be so convenient, though, if that was the one day that the guards... <sighs> oh, sorry. Um, that If that was the... My headphones keep falling out because I keep moving my arms. Um, if that was the one day where the Thieves Guild leader's like, you know what? I'm a guard today. It's time. I'm just gonna go buck wild and be a weirdo. I got paperwork to do, but here I am. <laughs> Guild leader, it, it, need, it needs guts to pull this off, or an idiot, let's find out. I, I love the trope of you're either super brave or super dumb. That's one of my favorite tropes. It's a, it's a good one. <sighs> okay. The yawns, they're coming. They're on their way. Okay, so we kind of got that figured out. Pink. Thieves. Okay, just double check. For some reason, these... This on the side looks bigger than this. Weird. My brain is just malfunctioning. Um. Oh, are they the same font? They are the same font. Weird. Um, okay, so he the Thieves Guild leader is much stronger than Cass is. Um, Cass wants revenge against the Myriad. People who attack Cass and Ellis are members of the guild, and about four rungs down the ladder. Um, Cass is blaming the leader. It's kind of a little ridiculous that he does want revenge against the leader when the leader has pretty much nothing to do with the event. Um, and the leader should acknowledge that the death of Ellis is not equivalent to the crime committed, which the crime committed is that they were stealing on Myriad turf. Um, he wants revenge against the Myriad, and he is dealing with someone who has a different moral compass to him, and we kind of came up with some little, little quotes and things, um, little actions that they could do. And then something to build the leader off of when the time comes to build the leader. I'm not, I don't want to build him yet because I like making my PCs, at least my major PCs, um, kind of the idea of them grow with the, the characters. So I don't want to finalize anything about him just yet just because I want, as the characters grow in the next few months of the campaign, I want the idea of this NPC to grow as well. Um, so yeah. The basis of him is that he probably knows what hardship is like, though. Um, whispered an art selection. Ooh! Okay, one second. All right, he sent me a link to this type of outfit. I like this a lot, actually. I think this would go well with the with the area as well, um, because everyone would be wearing. I I don't know how many of you live in a a climate that is super hot, but if you like look at construction workers and stuff here, it probably wouldn't be black. It would probably be white. His clothing because the sun would make that unbearable um but uh everybody who's like working construction or works outside does any outside kind of work you're gonna see them in long sleeve shirts you're gonna see them with um a cloth tied around their head and a little bit of a drapery to it um to keep the sun off their neck because the sun is so intense that just sunscreen does not cut it you have to have clothing covering you as well so I actually like this a lot, um, and I kind of like the idea of maybe these sleeves being connected at the bottom and not at the top so that it can have a little bit of airflow in between. I think that's fun. Um, 
Amon. Leader gets a note from one of the guards who noticed an intruder. That is a nice distraction from the boring day of work. He runs off to not deal with the boring paperwork. I like that. Um, advisor, not again. <laughs> and then Luna. Plot twist. No one but four select people have ever met the guild leader, so he walks around looking at how things are going and what needs to be done and catches the PC walking in and just smirks in, a movement, in an amusement and watches to see how long it goes on for and what the PC wants then goes back to the office to wait for one of the most trusted to bring the PC to him. I, I fucking love that idea. I love that so much. Unfortunately, it just does not work with the idea of this fight being a public spectacle. He has to be an example to some extent. Um, it's, it's really important, I think, for people to make fun of Cass, not for being a lichen or anything of the sorts, for people to actually respect him a little bit for it, um, because he's probably going to use it in the fight, honestly. Um, but it's also important for him to be made fun of. This sounds terrible, but be made fun of for something other than the way he was born. It's important for him to be made fun of for being a little bit of a dumbass. Just a tiny bit of a dumbass. Um, advisor, headmaster, we got too- we got too many requests to work here. He runs- he's run off again. <laughs> when you work outside, your brain melts. Yeah, mine does too. I- I actually prefer the heat to the cold. It's probably why I will never move above where I am in the hemisphere. Um, but I- like the snow- the cold just makes my brain shut off. Um, being in the heat, well, as long as I have enough water, I'm fine. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, Cass wants revenge against the Myriad. So, we kind of established him fighting with someone with a different moral compass. We established that he's probably hurt people in his past. And he's probably been hurt by people, at least emotionally, in his past. Um, so I do want flashbacks to be a little bit a little bit higher up on the rung. Just a, just a tad. We'll do this. Boop. Um. Hmm. This needs to be moved down a little. Oh my goodness! Hang on. Here. <laughs> there we go. Um. Oh, wait, you know what? Do, do. That's why I moved that down there in the first place, so I could move this up here. Um, and then. The Lycan City can be moved up slightly. Perfect. Okay. I think that we've pretty much finished Cass's story beats at this point. Is there anything that you guys are like, I just want to get this out and just out there into the world before we move on to the next character? Oh my goodness, we've done so much. We've done so much the past two days. My idea, one for a spy master changeling would be funny? Yes, I like that. I like that. Is there anything in this that would touch with the character before? Um... So, she hasn't actually gotten back to me yet, but I believe that her family, or not her family, the warlocks from the previous character are from Varshavon. Um, and we'll actually talk about Oriana next. Um, she has a, she has a lot of linking to Ayla. Um, but for Cass specifically, um, the Lycanthrope, uh, 
the city, the Lycan city in Varshavan is probably something that both of these characters would be aware of. Um, and something that I think they would probably want to avoid Varshavan as much as possible. Um, just because they're both essentially trying to avoid their family back home. Um, so I think that in the future that will tie in very, very naturally to Cass's story. I don't know if the changeling so I should be a rogue or a magic caster like warlock. So the I think that most of the thieves guild leaders would probably be very good at um, charming people, but probably not in the magic sense. I think that all of like of the three giant thieves guilds that I have in my world, I think they would all have um, a some kind of caster who is a close advisor to them. Or at the very least, someone they can call on. <sighs> so I would uh, I would assume that w at least one of his close advisors, his close friends, would be uh, a caster of some kind. I don't know how many rogues would like the idea of a warlock though, just because having a patron messing in their shit would be a little a little outside of their comfort zone, I feel like. I feel like they'd be uncomfortable with that. A warlock spy changeling could be an interesting mix if they can use the disguise self at will. Yeah, I definitely think that spies who have magic are very much in the world. And I would assume that this person who's probably insanely rich um, has a some kind of item that lets them change form whenever they want or rogue combined with eldritch adept and get the mask of many faces oh that is fun that is fun i like that a lot um the diviner bookkeeper who keeps the results of the sums instead of doing actual calculations <laughs> yes i like that i like that a lot that's so funny all right, my dog has to go outside, so I will be right back. If you guys have any ideas, uh, any other ideas, toss them in chat, and we'll we'll hop over, we'll run over them in the, in a second. Okay, I will be, I'll be right back.
Freddy, I'm back! Hello! <laughs> okay. Um, a diviner bookkeeper who divines the results of the sums instead of doing the actual calculation. I think that's so funny. Um, uh, because many forget changelings, um, that they change their physical form, not their armor. Yes, yes, yes. I gazed into the future as if these numbers added together. <laughs> Amazing. That's so funny. Somebody who's so bad at math that they were like, you know what? I'm just gonna learn divination magic, dude. I can't. I can't. I love that. It's so funny. Um. Okay. I think. I think we're done with Cass. I think that we've. We've beaten out the, um, how his, uh, Thieves Guild arc is gonna go. Um, I think we've kind of beaten out the ideas behind all of that. I think we're good to go on his. So now, let's go ahead and take a look at Orianta. So, Orianta, if eh, Orianta, Orianta is fun. So, Orianta is part of this cultish family type situation um and uh essentially let's go over the family first and how it works so the family was established in the very beginning of after the ancients era and i will actually pull up my history of veria document so this has all of my um all of my eras in it so basically the beginning when there was nothing and then uh, they started forming, um, they started forming, uh, gods, and gods started doing stuff in the foundation. And then the Arcane Ascension is essentially when the Raven Queen and Vecna rose from just being mortals to being gods, to having the power of gods. Um, and then the War of the Cosmos happened, where the ancient gods faced off against the primordial evil, which is... All of the evil gods and the what are they called hmm the primordials the the titans essentially um so this kind of details a bit about how the gods trapped the other gods in um in another plane in in their planes and then crafted the divine gate to basically seal that off um, from everybody um, and then the fifth era which is the era that we're currently in is after the ancients um, and the war of the cosmos is over with the ancient gods go to their home planes and then the di divine gate is officially sealed in place so they can't cross back over um, and then I, I basically detail where all the gods are located none of my players know this information um, this is just for my own sake um and yeah and then the prime material plane in the era of after the ancients so this family was established at the very beginning of the after the ancients so just after the war of the co the war of the cosmos um would have ended um yeah <laughs> i too lazy to do the sums looking into a future where he did the sums and copying the results so he no longer has to do the sums. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so this uh, family was established at the uh, at the beginning of AA. We are currently in year... Um, 1572 AA. So... Um, the reason why I chose uh, 1568 as the beginning of the buff or the end of the buff ducks, um, or rather, the buff ducks went on for about a year, so probably 1567 at that point. Um, the reason I chose that was because I wanted there to be at least two generations of elves to have passed away at this point in in this era, at least two generations. Um, so that's why I chose that uh, that year. Do, do, do. Um, the individuals who establish the Desdemona name are called the Elders. These Elders are actually super fun because we get to make up everything about them. Um, 
so I put two sections here that aren't filled out. So the Desdemona family. So these are going to be maybe extra people that we put into our backstory that may need description. Um, and then the elders are not um, described by her. So we get to make them up. Um, a lot of people don't think that they don't exist. But the sign that they do exist is that they um, have demands that trickle down the line of the family. The elders created this family to work around the divine gate. So essentially a god was like, yo, elders, do me a solid and do my great majestic work on the other side of the divine gate. Um, and basically this, this god is a, a being that A has a lot of, um, has a lot of knowledge uh, I think is really important to it um, but they also are so powerful that they can't cross over the divine gate so they're not just your average lower tier demon or devil or what have you um, so they are basically hoping to one day create a play uh, a way for the ancient being that they serve to enter into the plane and rule over it um, the family headquarters is located on Suhavne Island, and that is right here. This little island right there. It's right next to the capital of Jugad, so they can't do too terribly much culty type stuff that's just really blatant. Um, they have to keep up somewhat of a farce, a little bit of a... Um, keep a, uh, save a bit of face, essentially. Uh, in terms of no being normal to some extent and <laughs> not being a, a humongous cult. Um, so you don't have to be part of the blood and basically this is this is a cult. It is not a bloodline. It's not a family in terms of bloodline. Um, it is a cult and they make a, they bring in all types of people um who desires power strength forbidden knowledge and control um the family also has an ancient ritual that allows you to connect with somebody on another plane so it basically has a way of mass producing warlocks essentially um you have to prove your loyalty and commitment to the family before you're deemed worthy of learning and performing the ritual um traditionally on a day of magical surge so that's that would be things like solstices um so summer solstice winter solstice all that fun stuff um every individual in the family then accepts a spell that bars them from speaking of the family i think this would actually probably happen before the ritual um but they do have a spell that bars them from speaking of the family to those who are not within the family unless within the family headquarters um so this spell is actually uh the reason she included this is because i have a there in <laughs> all the way in broria in the amethyst caverns if you go down deep enough there is an ancient civilization that you can only find if you have basically pure intentions to some degree um and the people in there are have i don't want to say a ruler she's not necessarily a ruler she's more like a like a almost a parent <laughs> a parent to everybody um i don't want to say she has any real she does have authority over everyone it's called the city of Kasuma because her name is Kasuma um but in that city they have a magical circle that basically enables uh a a, a super high level spell uh that does not let you talk about anything within the city of Kasuma that includes any spells that you found anything like that and all things that are written down about it do not appear to anybody but people from that city. Um, so you could write about the the city and nobody would be able to see it. Um, do, 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 it would essentially disappear. And it doesn't turn invisible. It disappears 
Face, it's hard to explain. It disappears from existence to everybody except for those in the city. It's not invisible, if that makes sense. Um, so that's kind of where that idea came from. This circle, though, is a much lower level circle than that. It is capable of being dispelled very, not very easily, but at a decent enough level. Um, you can definitely roll for it on the dispel magic um, and be able to dispel it. So that is something to keep in mind there as well. Um, a spell of Omerta. What is Omerta? Tell me, Edwin. Educate me. Um, and then when the family gives you a task, you have to carry it out to the best of your abilities and within a timely manner. And then once you're in, you're never truly allowed out. Even in death, you still serve a purpose. Um, I kind of like the idea of their souls being used to power stuff on that island. I like that idea a lot. But that's something to get into later. <laughs> um, so, their story. Oriana's uh, mother, Adriel, was born into the family. And essentially, in her ritual, was like, Yo, I want to have a really high status. I want to have a powerful bloodline. And that will continue making an impact on the, the Desdemona family long after I am gone. Um, and then she essentially had high expectations on Oriana from an early start. And as we all know, gifted kids have it. <laughs> they have it weird. It's like good, but also bad. Um, so she was very sheltered, didn't really see people from outside the family. And Adriel told Oriana that they were destined to do great things for the family. Um, this is very mafia-esque, I think. Omerta, along the, the, along the mafia, a code of silence about criminal activity and a refusal to give evidence to the police. Yeah, that, that is pretty much perfect. Um, so, Fia, her other mother, taught her how to control and develop her magic. Oriana is a sorcerer first, warlock second, just a, putting that out there. Um, Fia never spoke about what her deal was, and Fia had a decent station among the elves in Roseweld, which are all the way in Broria, um, and is sometimes gone for long periods of time, but would bring Oriana fun gifts. Um, so, essentially, Oriana was looked after by a nanny named Corvina, and Corvina would tell Oriana, hey, you want to just go to my home in the Underdark, bro? And Oriana's like, yes, literally anything but here. And then one time, Coria Corvina brought Oriana to her home in the Underdark. And uh, Corvina got distracted and Oriana was kidnapped, as you do. Um, and then Oriana never... Um, so this actually also ties into our... Um, into Jesse's backstory, into Ayla's backstory, because the she would have been kidnapped by the um a lot of the same people that or that uh Ayla is trying to fight um once they returned home oriana was basically scarred for life and never asked to leave again <laughs> um she felt the world was a very dangerous and unkind place after that trip um after she was old enough she started to re receive tasks from the family most of them she'd complete while with her mothers or with her nanny um and she would start off easy gathering information um and then slowly worked her way up to even poisoning people on the down low when she was older um even sometimes dealing with lesser fiends and the such when some of the family gathered at the hub uh she also loved people watch and she calls people aunts and uncles which are the people in the family that she's aware of. Um, just because most members wouldn't share their name. There's a lot of spells and things that you can use with people's true names. Um, that you would... That you would essentially uh, not want to share your name. You would just use fake names for the most part. Um, and a lot of people who are in the upper portions of spellcasting wouldn't know this stuff. Um... 
And she once saw an uncle who was a warlock who made a pact to enhance his knowledge and research, um, making warforged hybrid beings. This also ties into Ayla's backstory um, because she has... Uh, I, I don't think I ever mentioned it yesterday, but she has um, uh, burned half of her body and that half is also decked out with um, machine parts. Um, and actually this has to do with her... Do, 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 her bonus feet that she has as well. Um, do, do, do. So that was just important for me to put in there just for my own knowledge. Um, one day they were given the task to pick up an item from Sola from a member in Jav God, and the member was late, so Oriana, they waited around for a couple of days um, and wandered the community, staying out of sight. Um, she came across a tra traveling entertainment group that was putting on a show. The group was called The Melody of Myth. This ties into, we haven't gotten to her yet, but Les Lesbilda, um, this character who is a, a basically a centaur um, except an elf and a deer instead of a horse. <laughs> um, called an elf tar, fun fact. Um, which I think is the dumbest name ever, but a pretty cool idea, nonetheless. Um, so, the, she went to, uh, to see the group, whoops, she went to see the group, and she was enraptured, and she met one of the members, Kieran. Um, Kieran lent her a book of poetry, and she spent the whole night reading that book, um, and once she finished, he lent her a few more. He told Oriana they would be leaving on their ship the next day, and he would hope that she, they would eventually cross paths again, um, to discuss the books that he gave them. Um, Oriana began to question what they knew about the world, um, which thus far has been on the two spectrums, <laughs> art and delight and being kidnapped. Um, so she's dealing a, with a bit of conflicting ideas, a bit of conflicting feelings about what she's learned about the world. Um, and uh, when it came time for her ritual, she didn't know what she wanted and she started, her brain was basically filled with ideas about what her fate would look like. Um, the next thing she remembers is waking up. She has no idea who she made the pact with. She has no idea what power she got. And, uh, she knew a pact was made, though, because she had strange new tattoos along her upper arms and back. Um, Oriana lied to their mothers and said that they- their pronouns are they, her, by the way. Um, and they made a pact for more power with an infernal being. Um, and then Adriel started to notice that something was wrong and basically kept questioning Oriana, being like, what did you make your deal with, kid? What the fuck is going on with you? Um, and Oriana eventually knew that her mother would figure it out and she didn't know whether or not she wanted to be dedicated to this cult her entire life. Um, so she decided to leave. Um, as soon as she was given the opportunity to, and she was given a task near Ceruse. Um, Ceruse is all the way up here. So, Suhavne down here, Ceruse up there. Um, Ceruse is also the closest point into Dekal. Um, so she, these are also, um, where centaurs and their goat variants, their deer variants and the such would live here. Um, they also live up and down the mountain as well, um, because there are giant goat variants of them. Um, and they, uh, would have helped her over into Alnar. Um, eventually she arrived there and these are basically her motivations she wants to experience life and avoid anyone who is with the family this family though is pretty widespread all over the world i mean we know from her one of her mothers being from broria and having a connection to the elves in roseweald that they're even all the way on a whole other continent um so I would also, uh, and actually I'm just gonna scroll down here because I kind of wrote some of these ideas down. Um, the family is spread out and aware that she's missing. 
So I think that the family would probably be too ashamed to admit that she ran away. Um, just because they, especially Adriel, um, Adriel wants to uphold the family status. So more than likely, she would have told everyone, my daughter is missing. She went on this quest up in Cyrus and never came back. Um, so more than likely, if somebody from the family were to recognize her and, like, and be aware that she was kidnapped they would see her with a random group of weirdos and be like okay we have to save her so they would start fighting everybody else more than likely that's probably what would happen um but some of the other stuff that uh we we i kind of included in this this is, should be smaller there we go the family wants her back for one um not only because she has made a deal with some being um but also because her mom does not want to uh, does not want to sully the family ma name essentially um the family does have a patron and that patron is able to connect people to their lesser patrons um oriana's patron we actually did talk about her patron a little bit he's just some random little gremlin dude who sits at the base of Yggdrasil, which is the, um, the Tree of Life, um, with the Norns, which are basically the three fates, essentially, um, who, and he did not want to be her patron, but here he is, just being her patron. Um, and then she will also meet up with, in the future, I do want her to meet up with the Melody of Myth and that one dude she met, Kieran, again. Um, so those are our main overarching story beats that I've figured out thus far. Um, so yeah. Uh, Luna, there is a- here's a reward of cash money for her. <laughs> for her return. Yeah, I think- I think that would probably be a big factor, actually. Let's go ahead and get this rock and rolling. Um, first let's- let's move everything over a little bit. Um, okay, so probably would have, um, uh, offered, that's the word, a reward for her, if I can, a reward for her safe return. Um, I actually want to... The family wants her back. Um... And would probably have offered a reward for her safe return. Okay, we gotta- we gotta make some room. It's been three seconds and we already need to make some room. There we go. Perfect. Um, uh, yeah, they probably, I don't think they probably would have given any details because they wouldn't technically known any um, if they were trying to keep up this lie that she was kidnapped. Um, they, I think they as a family would be aware that, um, that their daughter had run away because all of her important stuff is missing. Um, but I don't think that they would admit that to everybody else. Just because that would uh, ruin their family name just a tad. Yeah, our daughter immediately after taking this ritual that everybody in this family takes to make the family stronger ran away. <laughs> I don't think that would be very good for their family ma name. Um, so... Yeah, I think they would just pretend like they have no idea. No idea. Um, so they've offered a, a reward for a safe return. They'd be too ashamed to m admit that she ran away. Um, 
why is hang on let me check something for tina um So basically, she would be there because that would be the first city that she would come across. Um, so, she is avoiding the family. It's kind of this. Um, I don't think she has any, any particular quest lines that would need to happen in Alnar specifically. I think she would be more of a long con character. Um, she's definitely going to be something that... Oh! Actually, I need to show you guys her her feat because it's really important to her story. Um, so her bonus feat is essentially she can take advantage on a... She has four charges a day. Um, she can take advantage on a roll not including death saves and not including damage. Um, and she can impose disadvantage on a roll of a creature within 30 feet in sight, not including death saves and not including damage. Um, and of course this follows, um, I think Edwin is the only one who was there when I did my overview of my session zero. Um, but essentially the, um, the way that I do things like counterspell and that kind of stuff. Um, where somebody has to roll for a spell, um, they have to say that they are they are trying to um, d uh, counter spell or trying to figure out what's going on before I say the final result. So essentially, she'd be able to do this, but she would have to tell me, "Hey, they need to take disadvantage on that because I don't want them to succeed." <laughs> type situation. Um, so uh she can use two charges to ask for insight on an event to happen within the next three days the accurate ac the answer being more accurate and more descriptive the closer to the present the event is so if she's looking for something that's going to happen next year she's probably going to get an answer like could be this could be that could probably be this type situation um, but if she asked for something that, like, in the next five minutes, is somebody going to attack us, she would probably get the answer of yes or no. Because at that point, the fates would have had closely aligned to the present future. To the near future, I should say. Um, and then we decided on something fun called she dumb luck. So she can use two charges to enact dumb luck. So, like, let's say they're trying to break into something. She can use two charges to be to have dumb luck happen, and then all of a sudden, a pigeon flies into a guard's helmet and knocks him out. Like, that kind of dumb luck. Just something really goofy and a little stupid, but it kind of works in their favor. Um, and of course, if it comes down to her, like, which I don't think any of these players would abuse any of the abilities that I've given them, just personally, just how I know them. Um, but if they were to abuse any of the abilities that I've given them, there's always the, um, we, I've always, like, reserved the right to go back and change stuff, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, that's her fun little bonus feat. Um... I kind of want to make it five instead of four. I keep going back and forth on whether or not I want it to be five or four charges a day. There's part of my soul that wants it to be five. <laughs> but I keep flip-flopping. I have terrible, terrible commitment issues. Um, so. Oh, we also, oh, the family has a patron and then she has a patron. So we have to map some of that stuff out. The family is spread out and aware that she's missing. I don't know if I want this to happen in Alnar, but I do want someone to recognize her. Or recognize them. I they 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 are preferring that I use they as a primary, so I'm trying to use that. Mm. Do, 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 do. Perfect. For the sacred. Perfect. There, patron. 
perfect. Um, okay, so I need someone to eventually recognize them. At some point in time. I don't know if it has to be in Alnar. I don't I don't even think I want it to be in Alnar, honestly. I kind of want it to happen in Abra. But maybe towards the end. I want it to happen post Cass's main storyline. But before they leave Ombra. I think. <laughs> um, so I want Cass to, to duke it out with the Thieves Guild leader. Um, and then uh, and then for somebody from Oriana's story to recognize them. Um, someone recognizes them probably in Ombra. And then, um, someone has to try to take her from her new, uh, try to take them. I'm so bad. Them from their new friends. Perfect. Down, down, down. Delightful. Um, okay. The family has a patron. I wanna deal with this. I wanna deal with this last. I think this is gonna be a bigger a bigger thing. I do want them to eventually meet up with the Melody of Myth again, which is that basically bard troop. Um that Lizbuild is is part of and then she eventually breaks off from. Um so we're not doing just so by the way, we're not gonna be doing Lizbilda's uh future story beats just because she her her player, um, Alex wants to get a feel for the character when we're playing and then like finish out the beats of her, her back backstory um so i kind of want to go a little bit in the same direction and wait for the character to develop just a tad before we start planning out her future um so we'll we'll do a little overview maybe at the end of this um and then we will we shall see um they will meet up with the melody of myth eventually um i want that to happen um oriana's patron is just this little gremlin dude who is basically a tired a, have you you know the um the unwilling dad trope that's the vibe that i want for this he does not want to be he does not want to be part of this he did not want to be a patron to anybody and he honestly finds this a little a little much a little bit of a chore and he's kind of having fun a little bit just you know having giving this girl a little bit of luck giving this kid a little bit of luck and and um you know he's having a good time just being a little bit of a chaotic element in all of their lives i think um and then at some point she will either reach out to him in some capacity or um oh sorry um or she will go to him so she will reach out to him either dreams or prayers or what have you um and then the other little bit is that she will she will try to find him on his plane of existence. So, this actually kind of gets me into um, a little bit of how my extra plater worlds work. Um, so, if you do a little bit of research on the planes and how to travel between them, I'm actually going to pull that up real fast Varia groups Varia the planes um this is we're gonna use this 
This is the Great Wheel Cosmology. Cosmology? Yes, cosmology. Um, so essentially it's Prime Material, the Feywild, the Ethereal Plane, um, the Elemental Planes, and then there are the 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 bigger planes that are on the the outside. I I think the negative and positive plane idea is fine. I just don't know if I want to deal with it. Um, but the outer planes, these bigger ones, are essentially behind the divine gate. I think I don't think that there would be any creatures in the air, water, earth, and fire. Actually, no, that's not true. I think there would be titans in these elements. So the divine, the divine gate would be around the prime material um and then everything else would be behind the divine gate and able to travel to each other but of course different gods are going to have and different like greater beings are going to have different ways of keeping other gods out of their planes um whether that is their own little divine gate or um something similar but essentially, even a, a ninth level spellcaster would not be strong enough to not be able to pass through the, the divine gate, I think. Uh, you would have to have an insane level of magical power in order to be able to be a big enough problem that the divine gate catches you. So that's just a BT dubs out there. Um, that's how the planes are formatted. Um, but within these planes, you have, I think it's the Outlands? Yes, the Plane of Concordia Opposition. Um, basically, in these Outlands are, um, a bunch of different places, locations in the Outlands. Um, there are the roots of Yggdrasil. A well at the root of Yggdrasil where the three Norns foretell the fate of all. So basically, if she wanted to get to wherever this dude is, she has to go to... They have to go to the Outlands first. Um, and be able to go to the Well of Erd. Um, where they would find the three Norns, as well as the little gremlin man that we have created. <laughs> who is her patron. Um, so that's a little bit of a fun fact. There. Well, perfect. She will try to find him on his plane of existence. Um, I think I the outlands. The outlands. Brilliant. Um, so that's kind of the the stepping stone that she has to go through. Um, also, in my world, um, the way that you get um, tuning forks for the um, plane shift spell is by essentially finding the ley line that is just invisible in the air. Um, you would probably be able to see it with a true seeing spell. Um, the ley lines um, essentially connect all of the planes to each other. Um, so these ley lines you would have to find one and then basically spend a couple of days uh, attuning a fork to it so these players would not only have to have the plane shift spell but they would also have to have a true seeing or something else that creative that they come up with to be able to find these ley lines um add second edition where um uh, Towns with, there are towns with gates to the outer planes on the outlands, one for each plane. Yes, exactly. That I think that um, that document actually has that in there. Sorry, this is partially stuff that I've found online, but also stuff that I've made up on my own. But if you go to, say, the roots of Yggdrasil, you can go through the opening underneath those roofs. Um, and get to the plane of Ysgard. I think it's Ysgard. If I'm not incorrect. Arzara Gehenna. Arcadia Berea. Yeah, Ysgard. Um, and then that's that's basically uh, the same for all of these. 
Um, not all of these, but quite a few. There's the Caverns of Thought would lead you to, um, what is the one with the, the Plane of All Knowledge? With the, um, the Beastlands. It would lead you to the Beastlands. Um, I don't, I don't think I actually wrote any of them down, but a lot of these locations go to, um, places in other planes. They're portals, like you said. Um, do do do. Oh, the sleepies are hitting me. Good thing this is our last one. Um, they, so... She'll try to find him on his plane of existence, the Outlands, and then from there she could find pretty much any any other plane that she could ever want to go to. Um, but yeah, so she will eventually have to find a way there. <sighs> um, the family also has a patron, which we need to discuss a little bit. But is there anything anyone wants to add to the conversation of everything else that we've done for her thus far? Because this is where we're going to get into the the big part of the campaign, I think. Because of this this little shit. This little fucker. It's going to be fun. some of these down. We're gonna have to move this ever so slightly. Eh, quite a bit. Alright. The patron is able to connect people to their lesser patrons, which is really important. Um, I do want this, I want this patron to be devilish or demonic in nature. So abyssal or infernal in nature. Um, and they have to be a big enough thing, like almost god level, if not already a god, in order to be trapped by the divine gate. So I think we have a couple of options here. Uh, Varia the gods overview. Do, 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 do. We have Asmodeus, who is the god of tyranny, and he is in the um, infernal planes, so the nine hells. We have Bane, the god of war and conquest. I believe he is in the. Um, I believe he's in the. Uh, Oh, he's in Arachion, so he's not in that plane. Okay, let's look at Arachion real fast. The planes. Arachion. Is this supposed to be Atron? Hang on. I may have just misspelled that. Prosari. Atron, I did. I did just misspell it in the overview. Atron. Perfect. Let's look at Acheron. Um, The infinite battlefield of Acheron was an outer plane representing alignments between lawful evil and lawful neutral with emphasis on law. Um, Acheron's bridge between the Order of Nirvana and the regimented evil of the Nine Hells. Basically, each level has its own different thing. Let's see if I actually have him in here. Bane. Bane's Realm, Avalos. The Black Bastion was on Avalos as well. Um, so these, uh, I think most of these gods, uh, most of these people do not exist in, in my planes, but I was just copying down information on the um the planes to decide what i wanted to actually use um so avalos was the location of bane's realm the black bastion hmm let's take a look iron shod planes of atron so this would be a more of a battle based god i think 
I don't know if he particularly serves our purposes, but let's keep him in mind. Um, we have... Groomch, Chaotic Evil. I think that this... I feel like this god would be a lawful god. I don't think that they would be chaotic. It's just the the packs and how organized this entire thing is just feels lawful more than chaotic to me. Um, so I think we're looking for a lawful evil. Um, mm, yeah, lawful evil person. So let's grab this. Down, down. Um, so our options are Tiamat, Asmodeus, and Bane. Let's look at Tiamat. Um, Mother of Dragonkind is the goddess of chromatic dragons. Um, in my world, that's not entirely accurate. Well, she is the goddess of, it, of chromatic dragons. Chromatic dragons are not inherently evil. So, um... She's the rival of her brother Bahamut. Um, I I didn't write this down, but she dwells. She's locked somewhere, I think, in the abyssal plains. I haven't decided yet. I don't think I ever did decide it. Um, Mechanus Atron, the Nine Hells, Gehenna, Hades. Carcerai? She's probably in one of these three down here. I would guess. Um. Oh wait, no. I had to have given her a, a plane because I did it up here. Bator on Avernus. Perfect. Um, greedy, vain, arrogant. Strengths of all evil, dragon kind. Um, demands reverence, homage, supplication, and tribute from her subjects. I feel like because of her vainness, she wouldn't want to be unknown. I feel like she would. I feel like she would make her. Her. Um, her followers know who she is and worship her for what she is. Um, so I don't think Tiamat is it. I think it might be just, you know, good old Asmodeus. So um, Asmodeus is basically the ruler of all devils. Um, and I very much want to have a... Um, I want the overarching... I want the overarching... Um, storyline um to be having to do with demons and devils fiends of all kinds and dreams so that's the overarching idea of this campaign i often like using Mammon the demon prince of greed lord of the third layer of hell yes let's look at the nine hells oh i never finished it because there was so much to fucking write on it. I remember. There was a lot. There was a lot to write on it. <laughs> I do have so many notes. I don't know where my notebook is right now, though. I don't see it up there. Okay. So, we may have to come back to the exact um, ideas of all this. But I do like the idea of maybe one of Asmodeus's, um generals being... Uh, being a a big part in this being the what's it called the patron so we're gonna do asmodeus maybe one of his generals hmm i don't like how it does that dash <laughs> Maybe one of his generals? Okay. And I also think that 
would make it extremely easy for Asmodeus to be the one um, basically behind all of this, even if it is one of his generals, ultimately it is him. Um, because he would just give, you know, these packs to his underlings. It'd be easy peasy. Um, so I think that's a really good idea. And then, um, something else we have to figure out is how this looks in the overarching everything. I do want this to tie in, ties in with the warlocks, um, in Ayla's backstory. Wow, wow. Um, and on top of that, I want, so what if we made a general, or maybe even, like, took one of the existing generals of Asmodeus and made them dream-themed? Because that's kind of what I'm wanting in this, is for these little, I, I kind of want to do the whole, um, what's it called? My brain is not working today. <coughs> I want to do the whole um, sleep paralysis demon thing. Um, where in history, people made up different ways to explain sleep paralysis. Um, and of demons like sitting on their chest. I kind of want that to be a little bit of a reality in this game. I, I want one day for these characters to wake up and literally see their sleep paralysis demon in front of them like that shit's terrifying i think that would be a lot of fun um so sleep <laughs> a lot of fun wrecking my players lives paralysis demons um and then we'll write a little note in there just a tiny one just a tiny one saying um, one day, or one night, I should say. One of the players wakes up earlier than expected and sees one of the demons, but they are real. So essentially I want them to be like, yeah, you know, sleep paralysis demons, nothing super spooky about that. It's just, it's a sleep disorder. Um, and then I want them to wake up and stand up and be like, oh man, rough night of sleep. And then they just see a demon sitting on somebody's chest, staring at them. I think <laughs> that is not only a little freaky, like you just look up and you're like, what the fuck is that? But on top of that, it's just a little humorous that they're both just like, I wasn't expecting to see you here. I think it would be a mutual shock to some extent. Um, mm -mm -mm. Ties in with Ayla's backstory, maybe one of his generals. The patron is able to connect people to their lesser patrons. Um, I think we'll actually put that right there. And then ties in with the warlocks right there. Brilliant. Then we'll move that one up one and that one up one. There we go. Um, yeah, family has a patron. Patron's able to connect people to their lesser patrons. Um, maybe one of his general ties in with the warlocks in Ayla's backstory. Um, sleep paralysis demons. One night, one of the players wakes up earlier than expected and sees one of the demons, but they are real. Lovely. This is gonna be so much fun. <laughs> um, okay. I do want this patron to be the big bad to some extent. Um, this... I had a, um, oh, 
Oh, hello one D&D, welcome back. I <laughs> guess I'm late to the party by almost three hours. Yeah, it's, it's okay. <laughs> we are just, uh, I think we're about halfway through probably planning out the story for Oriana in the future. Um, we are definitely getting, uh, we're getting places with her. So she basically has a cult-like family that's not bloodline related necessarily, except for her, her mother, um, her mothers, I should say. Um, and they are, um, and Oriana is has run away from this family at this point. Um, the family wants Oriana back and the family is spread out unaware that they're missing. Um, so somebody has to recognize them at some point. I think that should happen in Abra. Um, and we actually just talked about um, Cass, who is the werewolf um, in our story. Um, and he is he has a he has beef with the thieves guild, which that whole beef is gonna go down in Ombra, which is the capital of Dakal. Um, and yeah, so we want her to meet up with some people in her backstory. She has her own patron, and then there is a patron that is basically in charge of this family who's basically speed running warlocks, <laughs> um, mass producing them. Um, so yeah, that's what we're doing right now. How have you been? How's it been going since the last 24 hours since we heard from you? <laughs> um, so I do want this patron to be the big bad. And I don't, I don't know if I want that to be in the form of they are going to come back, but rather that they are taking over the minds of a lot of people and they're causing a lot of mischief within um especially the governmental bodies of the entire world i think that would be very a little bit more compelling than just oh this person this demon wants to go through the divine gate type situation um it could be that they're trying to it could be that they're trying to have their followers hunt down the different sigils and the such that are on the divine plane or the divine plane um that are on the material plane trying to uh take uh trying to dispel or get rid of those those sigils um that are uh basically anchoring the divine gate in place around the prime material um so i think I think that might be the big bad situation where they're trying they're trying to stop the divine gate from being essentially unhooked from the prime material um, because once the the anchoring to the prime material plane would be ceased on the divine gate I feel like it would be a little bit easier to destroy the divine gate entirely um, so yeah I think we might go that direction. Um. <laughs> here, we'll move all this. Whoops. We'll move all this down a couple of notches. Choose one as general Tizen with the warlocks in Ayla's backstory. Like paralysis demons and the big bad. Okay, so that's awesome. Perfect. Um, so it's been good. Long day at work. Decided to take a break and see what's going on. Nice. Yeah, of course, my dude. Um, yeah. So D and D is a great break. I. <laughs> I think it's probably it's probably my favorite of my hobbies. I I just love thinking about it. I love coming up with new ideas and coming up with um, even when I'm a player, I spend a lot of time just like going through my notes and being like, okay, let's try. We need to do this, this, and this, and figuring out some fun stuff that we can do in the future. So yeah, I love D and D. 
Um, so be the bad, big bad. Um, and he's probably, I feel like whoever this is, is probably trying to get through the divine gate for one. Can I spell? The answer is no. Divine gate. For one. And then for two, I think that they're probably trying to lessen the impact or lessen the tie that the gate has to the um, prime material um, and I think that's probably where we'll find our main conflict right there of course I I don't like solidifying my my end game until I'm a little bit into the campaign. I just I need to get a feel for how this group is going to solve problems um, and also get a feel for how investigative they're going to be. Um, if they aren't going to spend a lot of time looking into um, looking into everything that's going on in their world, then I'm probably going to make it a little bit more obvious and not something that they have to uncover per se. More that something will that will come across their path. Um, and ultimately those decisions lie in how my players end up interacting with my world. Especially, um, so Dakal is like the origin, origin of all arcane magic to some extent. Um, Dakal is the first place they discovered that you can interact with the magic of the world outside of having somebody give you power. Um, so yeah, that's just, that's something that they're gonna be able to interact with. Um, and actually I kind of want to put that in there. That. I just want to, I want to tie that into the big bad idea. Uh, to call, whoops, was the first place where every, or mortals, I should say, mortals, um, discover that they can, bleep, bleep, um, get magic from the world itself and not just from a greater being giving whoops giving it to you perfect bring this up a smidgen and then we bring this open a smidgen Perfect. Okay. I think... I think that kind of does it for our future story beats for Oriana. Um, unfortunately, a lot of her story depends on how she reacts to this situation of the family finding her. Um, and then ultimately how she reacts to them trying to return her to the family um yeah i think that i think that is what needs to happen before we can map out more of her future story beats wow oh my god we have done so much you guys um, I just want to give you guys a quick overview of Lizbilda because um, as I'm going to be talking about the campaign in the future um, and especially as I'm going to start session planning and all that fun stuff, um, I do like you guys have to be aware of who she is and what she does in her story. Um, so Lizbilda is our fellow bard. <laughs> she is a elf tar, which is basically a centaur, but a deer. And instead of human, it's an elf. Um, so Lizbilda is our, uh, so I have a personal vendetta against the centaur race in D&D &D because I think that 
player characters should not be large, and I think it's ridiculous that centaurs are considered medium. And they can let somebody who is a full-size, like, human ride on their backs. That's a little... That's just... I can't. I, the answer is no. And so we kind of got into a, uh, a, a bit of a compromise by her... She suggested um, that the... Um, that she would just be like a small size deer so medium like basically a a mini version of a centaur like a pony a pony centaur a pony tar but a deer <laughs> so that's kind of the backstory on how we we got her character started um and then we also uh made a um we started talking about her backstory and so in the in Broria un momento um she would have lived somewhere along where this mountain range now lies and roughly 50 to 80 years ago and her character is a little over 100 at this point um probably a couple decades over 100 at most um the during her younger life the Honrith Mountains would have been raised to stop the war between Freya and Broria. Um, and she, her family, who had not gotten the message, um, would have, uh, they would have died. They would have been destroyed by the, by the mountains and she would have been an orphan. Um, Luna, do you have any where players could read about what they learned during the campaign, like World Anvil or something like that, so they can keep up to date with it and go back and review it? Actually, yes. So, um, it's, for my players, I set up a, <laughs> so what I plan on doing is we will be playing our sessions on Zoom. So I'm going to go through the, the Zoom recordings um, and do, essentially, I'm, I'm going to show you guys what I do for um, my current camp, for the campaign that I play in, um, where I'm also the resident note taker with 100 pages of notes. <laughs> um, so what I do is I just use this program called Filmora. It's really cheap. It's like, uh, at least compared to other, to other software it's a one-time payment of i think like 60 bucks when i paid it it may have been on sale or something like that um and hang on it's it's taking a second there it goes um and so what i do is i go through and i just edit our sessions so that they're um they have music in them um and that's hang on closing Once it loads up, perfect. Um, and so basically I go through and just add music to all of the important parts so that we can rewatch them all. So that's what I do. I'm a little extra, okay? Just a little. Um, so what I will be doing is going through and making my own notes. Um, but what I suggested for them was to have a document uh, where they can all um, take a look at that. Give me one second and I will pull up the actual folder that I have them doing that in. Un momento. Um, so this is the folder that I have set up for them. Hang on, I have to resume out. Um, so they have their team notes. I'll eventually put the recordings in there and then they'll be able to toss any other documents that they have um, or that they want to um, put in here as well. Um, so yeah, this is essentially, they'll be able to, I don't really expect them to remember everything, but I expect them as a team to take notes and uh, and be able to remember most important details as if they were the characters of the world. Um, if they expect me to remember everything, my answer is no. <laughs> I, I think that Dungeon Masters, and this is partially why I, I take such good notes, uh, as a player. Um, I think that Dungeon Masters already have 
enough on their plate. Um, to the, on top of that, remember what all of their players know. Um, on top of everything they already know in the world, they have to separate that from everything that they know um, from what the players know. And I think that's just too much to ask of a DM. So I tell my players, if you don't remember it or you didn't write it down, you don't remember it and you didn't write it down in game. Um, the only exceptions that I really do for this are to, um, are essentially like if you are trying to remember a, the name of a leader you once met, like I'll, I'll like, I'll give you that information or I'll give you a little culture tidbit that you may have learned that you don't remember, um, with a history check, of course. Um, so yeah, that's how I run my games. I don't. Yeah, I just think that's too much to ask of a DM, personally, to to remember everything that the players know. Um, let me fix my screen again. Un momento. There we go. Perfect. Um, alrighty. So, Liz Vilda, I, I thank you for that question, by the way, Luna. Um, so, Liz Vilda, eventually, um, being an orphan finds herself in Blossom Burrow. Um, and Blossom Burrow is very unique in the, the families of the Brorian Empire in and of the fact that they are a little bit younger to some extent. A lot of the people there were either killed in the war or refused to leave Blossom Burrow and thus were killed during the raising of the Honrith Mountains. Um, so a lot of them are, um, it, a lot of the culture there is a little bit more accepting to people who aren't elves and originally part of the family. And so the Brorians actually have face tattoos. And I will show them to you guys. Face tattoos that they um that they are they are part of. Let me see. Where is the one that I'm looking for? This one. Um Mark of the Censured. Hang on. Uh open link. Yep. Okay. So the Mark of the Censured is essentially a tattoo right here. And another fun fact, I actually have the meanings of all these, or not the meanings, the, uh, what all of these look like. Beria, uh, Country Histories, Latour, Broria, the families of the Brorian Empire. So the families of the Brorian Empire all have different, uh, stylizations of their, um, Of their of their tattoos um so uh, the city of blossom Borough would have these more like leafy flowery um plant vector flourishes um so that's just a fun little fact right there um but the mark of the century is essentially basically if you, once you've reached your hundredth year you get the mark of the century in most families people who are not elves would not get these marks um in blossom Burrow, it's a little bit more common for people who are not uh elves to get these marks because they have a higher population of gnome and halfling um so basically those who have re got have this mark have reached the beginning of their first century and have been recognized as an adult member of that familial clan um while they do um allow people to get the mark of the censured for the most part they don't get any other types of marks um from the from the families um so that's just a, a fun little world fact there <laughs> um so she does have her mark of the censured um as she grew up in blossom Borough, and then eventually after she reached her hundredth year she moved on and became part of that um that traveling troop that we talked about earlier um the myth the melody of myth um so after i think it would actually have been while oriana saw this group 
she would have been a lesbildo probably would have been part of the melody of myth um so yeah uh the i can't recall i don't even think we came up with a reason why she left the group but lesbilda did eventually leave the the traveling troop and is now in alnar more than likely because um more than likely because she wants to get fire opals ingrained in her um in her musical instruments um so yeah that's kind of how far we've gotten with her um she also in her youth met a archfey <laughs> Um, because the Feywild is something that she loves a lot, especially in her world. Um, but she also has the, uh, she wanted to have a little bit more in there. So she has this little blessing from the Archfey that we came up with. That is called, she called it Assiduity, which is, she gave me a definition. Assiduity. Assiduity. I can't remember. Hang on. Let me pull it up. It means constant or close attention to what one is doing. Um, so basically when she was younger, this would result and her character is supposed to be a little shy. So this part especially would be a fun little role play um piece to to pop in there um but basically people turn you turn people's heads wherever you go willingly or unwillingly um and then twice a day you're able to enthrall any creature in hearing or sight distance anyone with an intelligence of 10 or under instantly fails so i i was actually thinking about maybe making it a wisdom instead of intelligence but meh um, and all other creatures have to make a saving throw against your spell save DC. You choose any of number of creatures to not affect, just so that this doesn't fuck over her group. Um, and then the secondary effect only goes into effect if you roll a d20 plus charisma mod at DC 15. Um, so if she fails, she rolls a d6. Um, and they, this a random effect is put into place, including garner a crowd they all become paranoid and have advantage on perception checks so she could uh fuck over her team a little bit with that one <laughs> um and where am i looking um and uh there's just a bunch of other things they shout out a deep secret they become enraged uh, they start dancing erratically and beatboxing terribly and they start slapping themselves it's just a bunch of random fun stuff that's just a little silly just a little and enough to make people around them be like hmm this is a little weird what is happening um and then all effects end after either music or visual stop or after five minutes whichever comes first um i know a dm that uses world anvil and only updates it to what information he tells players after the session is over if he hasn't mentioned something lore related is isn't on world anvil no mentions of the big bad only has old gods from previous campaigns that the players know of. It's really interesting to watch it slowly update as the players find out about its world. That is, that's really cool. I like that a lot. I just not, my brain is not capable <laughs> of separating what I know and what the players know and taking the time to recall that information. Um, unfortunately. It's just a little, especially because for my D&D notes, which I already am going to be writing on my own, I want to also put like DM comments in there being like, this is what this is going to impact in the future, that type of stuff. So I don't want to have two separate sets of notes. I really love that idea. I just don't think I'm capable of doing it just because my brain capacity is very small, very, very small. But I would love, do you by any chance have the link for that person? Because that's a really cool thing I'd love to check out. I think that's really cool. Um, yeah, so... I think that that just kind of covers everything 
that we that we have to do today i don't think there's anything else uh in terms of future story beats for the players themselves um that we are doing so i think i think that completes the base of what we're doing um i do have a question for you guys in terms of like future streams because um at I mean, when I first started this, I didn't think that there would be anybody watching. <laughs> so I, I didn't really think about what to do in terms of entertaining people. But I was thinking about maybe writing out my session notes and then you guys could see that process for the first, for the first game. Um, but that's going to be a lot of, you know how like when I start writing stuff, I just start mumbling. Um, it's gonna be a lot of that, so I don't know if that's what you want to watch, so maybe I will just do that off stream, or maybe I'll do it on a stream acknowledging that nobody will hop on and join. Um, so, I, yeah, <laughs> I want to know what you, your guys' opinions are on watching me do that, I guess. I don't know. Have you tried juggling? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It is a, it's a little bit like juggling. Um, yeah, so do you guys have any opinions on that? Um, yeah, that's my question to you. I'll just hang for a couple of minutes for you guys to, to reply. Um, I'm gonna save this so it does not freak out. Where's the call button? Seems like he hasn't updated it in a while, but here's the link if I can post it in chat. You should be able to. I don't think I've... I've deleted that. I'll actually just move this up here. I don't think I, I disabled that feature. Yes, perfect. Copy. One second. I'm in tech, so you know I have to check it in virus total. <laughs> Just in casies. Throne of Aiden. Realm of countless intrigue, plots, magic, and history. It's a place where royal battle lines vie for supremacy control and fight for their place in history. Cool. Timelines, the age of. That's so cool. Okay, the age of rising. Interesting, that is so fun. I really, that's really cool. Read world meta. Inspiration, creative mode. Um, Divinity Races maps. Cool. So, I'm an author, I'm a game master. Oh, interesting. Races, Divinity, lore, Divinity. The Dreamers! Cool, this is really cool. Thank you for sharing that. Some of the things in those have to do with previous complaints and some of the gods are old PCs. Nice, that's really cool. Okay. 
Alrighty, if you guys have no opinions on the session notes thing, I think that might be what we'll be doing Tuesday. If you want to, you can just direct message me and let me know um, what you think would be um, what you would like to do in terms of that. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's it for today. <laughs> uh, thank you guys so much for joining me on my my campaigning journey. I'm having a lot of fun like getting to brainstorm with people. It's just really cool. Um, and thank you for contributing to how much fun my players are going to have. I think this is going to be a blast, honestly. So, yeah. Um, I guess, I guess that's me signing, signing off. I guess you guys have a good day. Bye. <laughs>